Six months later, divorcing my husband was a huge mistake. This one is long, but worth it for everyone to read. If I could give anyone a piece of advice for divorce, it would be to not do it under normal circumstances. If your spouse is beating you or threatening you or your children, then, of course, get out and run. In my case, there was no abuse. We were together for eight years, which was mostly good, and we have four kids. Right around five years ago, I got a promotion at work, and I got it in my head that my ex-husband was dragging me down, or at least holding me back from more success and a better life. We never had a lot of money, but with my promotion, I was now making more than he was. I started working longer hours, and at the same time, his hours were cut, so he was at home more. I really began to resent him because he was home and because he got to spend time with our kids. Most nights when I got home, they were already getting ready for bed, if not already sleeping. After a few months of my new job, it was clear to me that things were not going well at home without me there, some nights the dishes weren't done when I got home, the kids hadn't eaten, or whatever else I could think of to be mad at him about. It really didn't matter. He kept saying that he would try harder but that it was hard being home all the time. That always made me really mad. For the next couple years, things kept getting worse. My hours weren't any shorter, and as were on and off full-time. There was no convenient time for him to be working full-time, because of my hours, but we also needed the money. Whenever he would tell me that he could get extra hours, I would always complain, and the fewer hours he worked, the more I complained that he wasn't bringing in enough money. Whenever he brought up the contradiction, I would tell him that he needed to figure it out. I knew that it would bother him, so I started saying that a lot and for everything that I could. I really started to resent him, and I pulled away from him. I knew that it was hurting him, but I didn't care. If he didn't want to be hurt, then he would at least try to make me happy. I used that same thing to justify it when I started to talk to another guy at work. I thought he was just a friend, but talking at work turned into texting at home, then pictures and videos, and then trying to sneak some alone time with him. I knew that it was wrong, but it made me feel so alive, and my husband had not made me feel like that in years. I was tired of being unhappy, and I was doing this for me. The worst was the night that I came home at a reasonable time and found that he had cleaned the whole house, cooked the whole family dinner, and picked out a movie for all of us to watch together. This would have made me swoon a couple years earlier, but that night, I couldn't even look at him, and I pretended to be sick. I spent the rest of the night in bed while he waited on me, checked on me, and even made me different food and brought it to me in bed. It made me feel terrible, and then it made me angry that he made me feel that way, and by the end of the night, I was texting with the other guy. Over the next month or two, from that night on, it did not matter what he did. He was wrong, just for breathing most days. He would get so upset with how I was treating him, and I would just wait and egg him on into losing it, because I knew it would happen eventually. After most of the fights we had, he would apologize for whatever I told him he did wrong, if there was even something, but I never did. I would usually find a way to make him feel even worse. I knew that I was right because he was wrong, and that was all that mattered to me. I even pretended that I didn't care when he found out about my relationship with the guy from work. It really destroyed me inside to see him holding back tears, but I wasn't going to let him see that. He was at his weakest, and that was when I chose to tell him that I wanted a divorce. I could almost hear his heart shattering inside his chest. He talked, fought, and said that we could work through it together. I really wasn't interested in fixing our marriage, but I mostly ended things with the other guy, but only because I knew I could get it back if I wanted it. I could see that he was trying, and occasionally I would let him know, but for the most part, I kept being a huge bitch to him for any and all reasons that I could think of. I'm not sure how much more the man could have done to make me happy, besides finding a job that paid enough for me to not have to work at all. He said that he was looking, but looking and finding are two different things. It was around this time that I discovered this group and a few others. I started posting things about him, from my perspective only, and I got so much positive feedback for how I was feeling that I knew I was right. The more I posted, the more validation I got. It wasn't just me who knew that my ex-husband wasn't worth keeping around, I had the whole internet telling me how terrible he was. I started saying awful things to him and even outright ignoring him. I was so confident in mine and everyone else's opinion that I contacted a lawyer, and within a couple weeks, I had filed for divorce. I continued to use this site and a couple others to validate my feelings and for encouragement to go through with it, and finally it was done. It went pretty smoothly. Ex-husband didn't ask for much, besides to not get divorced and to try to work it all out. 
I didn't care about that, though. He was broken, but I was free. I could do whatever I wanted without having to feel any guilt or answer to anybody. It was an amazing feeling of freedom. It didn't last long, though. In the first month after he moved out, I missed garbage day three times. There was also rarely a single clean dish, and the laundry sat in piles for so long that I had to start doing the sniff test to see if it could be worn again. I also never saw my kids more miserable. My oldest had seen some of the messages from the other guy months earlier, and she knew that ex-husband still wanted to try to work it out. It didn't take her long to stop talking to me at all, except to say that she wanted to go to ex-husband's house. The others all told me that they wanted to live with ex-husband too. I did my best to try to make them happy, but I ended up just buying them toys all the time, and the happiness only lasted for a few minutes. I was also having a lot of trouble with work. Being alone, I couldn't work all those extra hours that I was expected to. I finally gave in and started calling my ex-husband to watch the kids. He would always come over as soon as he could, and he always asked me if I needed anything. When I would get home, I would find clean dishes, laundry, and even dinner sometimes. He would never say too much after I got home. He would just tell me to call him if I needed anything and leave. One night he took out the garbage and brought it to the curb because it was garbage night, and I forgot again. He always looked so sad when it was time to go. Finally, after a couple months, my friends convinced me to go out on a date. It was for dinner and a movie, and I was excited and hopeful, but at dinner, I started getting a feeling of overwhelming guilt. It got so bad that I ended up not even going to the movie. A week and about a million tears later, I was on a therapist's couch. I told her everything that had happened, starting with the promotion that I got at work. She did not agree with me or with any of the encouragement to divorce that I got. I ended up in her office two and sometimes three times a week, and the more that I talked to prove that I was right, the more that I started to see how wrong I was. It was truly heartbreaking, I don't know if I cried as much in my whole life as I did in the first month in her office. After about $2,000 of therapy sessions, I learned that my ex-husband had his faults, but I figured out that mine were so much worse. I did so many awful things, and said awful things that I wouldn't want him to be with me, but he did. I still remember him asking me in the meeting with the lawyer to please not go through with it. I did go through with it, though, and then later I bragged on here how great it felt. I was so wrong, and now I can see it. A couple weeks ago, I went outside with him when he was leaving the house. I asked him about getting back together. When he looked at me, his eyes were full of tears, and a couple went down his cheeks. He told me that he didn't know if he could. He said that the pain has been too much for too long and that if we got back together, I might just turn around and do it to him again. He said that he always thought that I would realize how much he loved me and stop until I signed the divorce papers and let out a big, exaggerated sigh of relief. He said that hurt him more than anything else and that he doesn't know if he can ever trust me again. I don't blame him. I destroyed a man who, looking back, was a great husband. I deprived my kids of having a great father in the house with them, and I took his kids away from him. And me, the one who pushed for the divorce, expecting happiness and a life of freedom, spends all my free time sitting at home or sitting on a therapist's couch. Please don't just take the advice of anyone on this site or any other about getting a divorce. If your marriage is bad, look at yourself first and see if you can make changes. This is advice for men and women. Getting divorced is not fun. Being divorced is not fun. And seeing your husband broken and your children never happy because of your actions is the most painful experience that I can imagine. I wish all of you well and hope that you will give your marriages a second chance. I, 43 male, need to send a letter of thanks to Dyson. I discovered my wife, 49, of 17 years, 18-month affair when I updated our fan filter on the app it uses. Betrayal in a long-term marriage. History. We were married for 17 years with no children of our own. She's been divorced once and had two daughters that I helped raise, now 28, 23, prior to our marriage. We've really only had minor bumps and issues, in my opinion. We've had an open door type of communication with each other. Whether it be work issues and venting, sexual issues, or just how we are feeling, often, we will just talk on the couch about life and philosophy in general. I've felt that we had a great connection and a pretty heavy, fulfilling sexual life. We are both in good shape and maintain a healthy lifestyle. I work in the medical field, and due to things being what they are, I have been putting in a decent amount of overtime over the past five months. 
She works in a legal consultancy and has been working from home, WFH, for the past five months. Which has made things a bit distant, but on our days off, we are tight. I changed the filter on the Dyson fan in our bedroom last night. I asked my wife if I could use her phone to update the app in order to reset the change filter alert. Mine was on the charger next to the front door. I noticed she had put on a pattern lock, and I kind of wanted to ask her what that was about. As I was looking for the app on her phone, a notification for Snapchat popped up. My stomach dropped immediately as I read the small tag. I'll bring the special toy. It said, my brain understood the words, but my mind just stopped functioning. She asked what the matter was after, I guess, several minutes of me just sitting and staring at the bedroom fan. My wife has an obligatory quarterly out-of-town meeting that puts her two states away for five days every business quarter. I knew it was about this coming trip on Monday. I've perused Reddit for years anonymously. I've read 100s of stories that began like this, and never once have I thought about it being me that would sit on my bedroom floor and be in such a cold, dumbfounded state. I recovered and said, oh, I'm just getting information about the internet protocol, IP, and router. That's how the fan communicates through the app. I have a Chromebook that she logged into Facebook yesterday. I took a week's vacation on short notice. My supervisor is a cool chick, and once I laid out what I may have discovered and had to do, I'm going to need time off. I've been up all night reading her chats. She left to go to the office just now, and I made sure the Google location history was on and found my phone was active. I'm so suspicious of everything she does now that I can't look at myself in the mirror. She doesn't know I saw the message notification. I logged on to the messaging system that Verizon uses and have signed in under her number and name. There are at least 15,000 that date back to February of last year, messages, memes, flirty pics, and some X-rated ones too. She stopped texting him this way about three months ago. I didn't stop texting him, but I stopped using the message app through Verizon. I'm guessing they switched to Snapchat because it's discreet. I'm not on any social media in any way, shape, or form. I am clueless. I just figured out that you can't log into Snapchat through Facebook. But it just takes an email and a password. And she has used this Chromebook to do that. Hell, she used it just three nights ago, lying in bed next to me, rubbing my back while I went to sleep. She messaged him and sexed him lying next to me. It's a young man from work. He is married and has three young children. He and his wife have Facebook. I've met him twice. He shook his hand. I'm at a complete loss again and have paced slash wandered my house, that I custom built for her, for hours. I almost can't feel anything. What little that I am processing is just white hot rage. I logged on to Snapchat, and there it all was. I have called my best friend, who has been divorced three times, don't get me started on his partner picker, and he recommended a vicious lawyer. I plan on recording and saving everything. There's a picture of them having an affair. I'm sure her phone or his has video. I desperately want this to be a bad dream, she said terrible things about me. She's told him about my insecurities. She told him, I love you. They have made no long-term plans, so this feels like a purely sexual relationship. It almost makes it better, but it also makes it so much worse. She's literally throwing away our lives for this. She knows cheating is an absolute deal-breaker for me. Our usual routine on the day she leaves for her meetings is to take her to the airport and drop her off with a long goodbye. I can't even think about what I have to do now. My friend says to print out the entire thing and see if I can recover things from Snapchat. From what I understand, I can't, unless I have her phone. My plan is to see the lawyer today, I'm paying a ridiculous amount to jump in her appointment line. Get the ball rolling and hopefully have a plan of action from her. I really want to book a flight follow my wife to the hotel she's staying at, and catch her in the act. I have access to her hotel booking options and have put myself as a contact person, so I can get a room key without alerting her. I think I'm just going to log onto the messaging apps when I get into town and watch it happen in real time. If I could get the papers ready in time, I'd hand them to her, instead, I'm just going to hand her the printouts. It's a 600-page PDF. His wife accepted my friend's request. I am debating sending everything now. I am seeing things. I just don't want to lose any advantage. 
I'm going to fly there Monday afternoon, log in and see what they've talked about, get a room key to my wife's room, and drop off the package in her room with my wedding ring. I'm going to sit in the bar and watch my phone blow up. I'm going to call the affair partner and tell him to meet me in the lobby or bar and to bring my wife down. Then tell him that a similar package has been sent by certified mail to his home, addressed to his wife. As well as a Facebook message that I plan on hitting send on as I tell him. It feels petty and weak. I want to rage and scream, but I'm helpless. This morning, all I could do was give her a peck on the cheek and say goodbye. I really can't stand to look her in the eye. I somehow have to get through the weekend. I guess I'm asking, is my spiteful, hate-fueled plan worth it? I just want to inflict pain at this point. I want to hurt her emotionally. I feel eviscerated and emasculated. I will not entertain an apology. This is the one act that is unforgivable. It takes so many steps to cheat on someone. They all can be stopped until the sin is complete. Then it is done. Should I just confront her tonight? Or catch her? I don't think I'll update. I'm truly thinking about never using social media again. And only being with a partner that has a similar outlook moving forward. ETA, I found a special toy. Keep in mind we have a chest full of adult fun devices. It was already in her carry-on. It's one of those remote control vibrators. The ones that can be controlled by an app. It looks expensive. I met with the lawyer in 90 minutes. Update, I have no clue how to post an update. I'm just editing my post. I met with the lawyer. She was actually kind, and I dare say compassionate with me. She told me point blank that her job was to represent me in this fight for my future. And my job in all of this was to tell her the complete truth and not make her job harder. I went to Kinko's and printed the file out. It cost $534 for color because I wanted to make the pictures pop. Shout out to Chris at Kinko's for not making a scene when the nude started coming out. He asked what it was all about, so I told him. He was taken aback, but I shook my hand and said sorry. I went home and crashed for about 3 hours, and STBXW came home around 19.30, the usual time. A lawyer said to forget any Hollywood confrontation in a hotel bar, that it would look pretty crazy and not become at all. So I'm sorry to all of those people who wanted the high drama. She's right, ultimately. There's two routes to take with divorce, contested or uncontested. She said I would have to notify my soon-to-be ex-wife, STBXW, that I have retained counsel, and in order to proceed, my STBXW would have to either contest the divorce or we would go through mediation and file from there. So, she got home about two hours ago. I asked her if there was anything going on that she wanted to talk about. She said nothing other than the election. She then asked what was bothering me. I wanted to cry, but, truthfully, I cried out. I said I was curious as to why she had a remote control vibrator in her luggage. The look on her face was actually more telling than anything I've ever seen. She looked panicked and pale. She began to breathe faster and sweat. I asked why she would have something like that. Who had the code and the app for it? She stammered, and the tears began. As I pulled out my three file folders worth of text exchanges, I asked if the affair partner's wife would have them. She cried and pleaded that she could explain. I said she had five minutes to do it. Of course she couldn't, I told her what my attorney told me to tell her. I also told her to leave. She screamed that it was her house too. I calmly told her that maybe, but I would be notifying everyone about her affair and betrayal. That even the girls will know. Or she can leave now and find living arrangements for the time being. Hell, she'll be at her work conference for a week. She was speechless. I calmly pulled up my Facebook and showed her the affair partner's wife. I said, do you want me to tell her, or are you going to do it right now? Tears and moaning and pleading with, I love you, and, it wasn't supposed to go this far. Then my favorite, you can't do this. I said, well, it looks like I'm doing it, as I sent the affair partner's wife a message with the file of their escapades on it. I prefaced it with apologies and a brief explanation. I haven't heard back from her. I leafed through the stacks of paper and started reading random excerpts out loud to my soon-to-be ex, I just wish we could spend the day attached to each other. Just you inside of me, you feel so much more intense than any other woman I've ever been with. 
she is still sobbing and asking to talk about us. She says our marriage can withstand her mistake. I told her I would never forgive her, that her word is shit, and that she threw away the last 17 years. I'm still entertaining the whole human resources thing, and I am going to tell everyone about her decision to end our marriage by cheating. Thank you to everyone who responded. I feel bad that I couldn't respond to all the private messages, PMs, and responses. I have a therapy appointment scheduled for Tuesday. I kind of feel extremely elated, I'm shaking and incredibly low right now, I kind of want to die. The house is pretty quiet except for her crying and moaning. I told her to not come back after her trip. I'm currently sending friend requests and trying to get everyone on my page, I'm just going to send it to everyone that way. I am going to wait until the morning to call the girls. I raised them when they were 11 and 6. They are women now, 28 and 23. I don't know what to tell them or how to handle them. Not going back to my cage after quarantine is lifting. Please excuse the lawn and ranting post. Brought to you by Freedom and Rum, 40-9-year-old male here, with a 46-year-old female wife, married 15 years, two kids, a 16-year-old male and 13-year-old male. Yeah, you guessed it. Surprise pregnancy with our oldest equals marriage to outsiders. We have the perfect life and marriage with a nice house, the usual three cars, two dogs, too much stuff, and my wife's 10 million Instagram post of our happy family inside the cage. It's nothing but misery. There's no kindness, no love, no affection, and no sex. There's only expectations I never live up to, demands and things I need to do and then redo because I never get it right. I'm in therapy for depression. And our youngest is in therapy for depression or anxiety. Only family members know this. My wife insisted we take our therapy in a larger town, an hour away, so nobody would find out. Both therapists have tried to get my wife involved in helping with treatment of the issues. And she's always refused. Everything is her way or the highway. I'm told if I leave or ever cheat, she'll make sure to take everything in court. Plus make sure to keep me away from my children. I hear this a few times a week whenever I haven't done exactly what she wants and done it to her. Perfectionist standards, I'm not even called by my name at home. It's always you're our father usually you need to do this for me, or your father is being stupid again. It's been like this since about a year after our youngest was born. There was a gradual lessening of sex, then affection, then even basic respect, to the point where I've become nothing more than an accessory for fancy pictures while in public, and a pathetic dumbass mental case in private and treated with disdain and anger constantly. I tried to get my wife to try couple counseling early into the decline, but there's nothing wrong with her. I'm the problem. It got worse after I was officially diagnosed with depression. She's been using that as a weapon against me. Even trying to discuss small things I'm unhappy with at home leads to a big fight and divorce. Threats every single time. Even mentioning that I'm having a bad day and need a break or some help just starts a fight or a mean lecture about I need to be working on myself. For the past 7 to 8 years, I've just been in a fog, going through the marriage coin sour, getting the depression diagnosed, the adjustment to different medications, trying to not let the depression affect my family, and the absolute soul-crushing hell of being married to someone who thinks I'm stupid and despises me, plus work, raising the kids, house chores, and getting dragged to whatever new thing my wife decided we need to do just so she can post pictures of her perfect family times, I've basically been living in hell. Until this quarantine, my wife insisted I leave the family home for the sake of the family because I still needed to go into work once or twice a week, and the kids both had childhood asthma and might be in danger. I wholeheartedly agreed to this, dead or safe than sorry. My wife insisted I pay for a hotel and stay there, but when her sister and husband found out I was living in a hotel, they invited me to stay with them up in the larger town until this virus problem was all over. That started a hell of a text and phone fight with my wife, of course. Since it wasn't her idea and she keeps our family pretty distant from her sister because supposedly she's a bad influence, then I was the bad guy for even answering the message my sister-in-law sent about staying over. With a polite no thank you. And I was making my wife look bad to say no, so I ended up getting told by my wife to go stay with them. But I'm still paying for it, in more angry messages and calls, than usual. I've never understood, until now why the in-laws are a bad influence. When they visit us for the big holidays and the kids' birthdays, they are always nice, fun, and good people to be around. What I'm realizing the longer I'm around them day in day out, is that the bad influence is the way they treat each other with respect and care. It's influencing me to realize that there's something else out there other than drudgery, dread, fear, and misery. Something worth losing my home and even my children for. 
I'm just so darn tired of it all, and I won't do it anymore. I'm sitting here, fourth drink of the night in hand, watching to people who care about each other make dinner together, talk about their day, and just be happy around each other. It's shoving in my face just how much I am getting mistreated at home. It's making me see that, despite my mental issues, I don't deserve being mistreated so badly. And I decided I'm not going back to my cage after this. There's no way my wife will ever change or the situation at home will change. I've been looking up legal separations, lawyers to hire, and apartments to rent. I've scheduled a virtual appointment with my therapist for tomorrow to get some guidance there. Two, I have a list of people to start calling tomorrow to start this divorce. I just want out. And I'm going to get myself out. Thanks for listening. Husband wants divorce after my cancer diagnosis. We have been married just shy of 26 years. I was diagnosed with multiple myeloma two years ago. At first, he was wonderful. Total helicopter husband. The first couple of rounds of treatment were awful for me. I was so sick, and I'm pretty sure I suffered from all of the possible side effects. In October of last year, I got the bad news that another line of treatment had failed and started my third line. So far, I have tolerated it well. My body has suffered, though. I have a large plasmacytoma on my chest as well as several collapsed vertebrae in my back. My back is hunched due to this, and until I can get my bones strengthened enough to hold the screws, I can't get the back surgery to straighten it. I have been on fentanyl patches along with several other pain medications, oral chemotherapy, etc. I'm not sure when it started, but my husband stopped coming to bed and sleeping on the couch. He wouldn't go to doctor appointments unless I specifically asked him to go. He wouldn't give me hugs, or if he did, they were half-hearted. I started saying stuff to him. And it seemed like the more I explained that I needed his love and affection and his support, the more he made a point of denying me. Finally, just before Christmas, I confronted him about it, but he just shut down, stonewalled me. The more I pushed for him to talk to me, the more nasty he got. Finally, he got angry and told me, Congratulations, your worst nightmare is going to come true. You're going to die alone, while I was crying for him to tell me what was going on, what was wrong, what had I done, he screamed at me that he didn't want to be married to me anymore. That was New Year's Eve. He left that night and has only come home to pick up tools or stuff he needed for work. He stopped paying my car payment and it got repossessed. He hasn't made the mortgage payment. Thankfully, the power is still on and he hasn't shut off my phone. I am on disability through my former employment but it isn't nearly enough to support me. We have two dogs and five cats that I have to take care of. I am not physically able to do most household chores, though I do the best I can. He still has not told me what the problems are in our relationship. All of this has blindsided me. I knew because I was sick that neither of us was happy, but I didn't think it was our relationship that was the problem up until he left. He would call and chat multiple times a day, still saying, I love you all the normal things, but almost subversively punishing me too. How does someone who has loved you for over half our lives suddenly become so vicious and uncaring? He was a sweet, affectionate, and protective husband until he wasn't. I can't wrap my mind around it. How does he justify it in his mind? Sorry for the bad grammar, spelling, and rambling. I'm a crying mess. He said he made a mistake. It's been a year since my husband of 13 years left me a text message. I was at work with no warning or signs. I read a couple texts that informed me that my extremely happy and healthy marriage with my best friend was over. He said that he had been feeling unhappy for a long time and just stayed with me because he was codependent. I had been encouraging him for years to go to therapy. He had one session and left me two days later. He took one of our dogs and moved to Arizona, effectively solidifying his decision and destroying everything we had built over the last decade. He was not interested in couples therapy or even talking at all. He told me I needed to give him space to grieve. Fast forward a year. I thought I would be absolutely destroyed, but I'm not. I've dated, I have made new single friends, and I have gained 10 pounds and lost 20. I have managed to figure out a budget to afford my two dogs, house, and car on about 30% of what we collectively made before. I am happy. I am still grieving the life I thought I would have, but I have hope. The text that I wanted so badly to receive in the first couple of months after he left finally came. He left because he had a panic attack, a midlife crisis. He regrets it. His life is awful. He has 20 $28. He has no friends in Arizona. All of his friends and family are in our home state with me, and his family barely talks to him. Now, they were furious with him because they love me. I was the best, most amazing wife. 
He had no idea what he was giving up. He wishes that he could erase the last year. It had nothing to do with me. He still loves me, and he is miserable. If I told you that it didn't affect me at all, that would be a lie. Neither of us is naive enough to ever consider a reconciliation. It would never work. I would never trust him, and he would never be able to make up for what he did. But when I got that text, I didn't need it. I no longer needed it. I no longer need him. And that's got to count for something. Choosing kindness during divorce. Today, my soon-to-be ex-husband told me that the reason he has been eating so much fast food every day is because he doesn't really know how to cook anymore after 10 years of me cooking for him all three meals a day, even when I was working more than he was. I wanted to be petty and mean. He took me for granted in our marriage, and I wanted to ask him if that had changed now that we've been separated and living apart for five months. Instead, I gave him some of the recipes that I remembered him liking that weren't too difficult, and it felt so good. I realized it doesn't matter if he still takes me for granted, or if he feels sorry for treating me the way he did. It's in the past. I can't change anything about what happened. All I can control are my own choices, and I have to believe that choosing kindness is the best way to bring happiness into my life. Divorce feels so much like a battle some days, but I encourage everyone to choose kindness in the little moments they can, if only for that little boost of serotonin. She regrets it. We divorced a year ago, and it destroyed me. After 12 years and two kids together, she cheated with a co-worker and left me for him. Everyone told me that she would regret what she was doing, but she was so cold and sure that I was the one who ended up filing. After the divorce, she bought a small house, and the guy lives with her. My kids have lived with this man for half their lives. I really try not to think about it too much, but it sucks. I have a girlfriend I met soon after the divorce, and we be fallen in love, so I stopped thinking about the ex very much. Then a few days ago, I got a call from her, which is strange because we barely talk. She was asking if I was happy. Saying that she has no family or support network here. She s unhappy. She missed us being a family. She asked if she would ever have a chance with me again. I would have given anything to hear those words last winter. I wanted so badly to save my family. But I've moved on, and I'm never going back. I told her no. I told her that I would always be there to help with the kids. It hurts to know she is suffering and to know she completely messed up her life for this jerk, but I'm done. The hardest thing to let go of is wanting to take care of her, and even now I just want her to be okay. Xwif had to move in with her folks. Feel bad. Nope. I got divorced back in May 2017. My ex-wife requested 50% of my take-home pay in spousal maintenance or alimony because she's too sick to work, but no evidence. Plus, child support will be based on my only visitation. Plus, she wanted me to pay for her to get private health insurance. Plus, she wanted 50% of the equity in the separate and my sole property house. Plus, she felt that the 2015 Altima I drove was a marital asset, but the loan to buy the car was all on me. Plus, she wanted 50% of my 401k. She refused to work, pill-popping problems, and didn't drive, due to a dway from popping pills. She actually tried to argue that the $7,000 in dway fines were a marital debt, but her lawyer told her, you are treading on thin ice, lady. In the end, the judge awarded her zero in alimony. I got 50% custody. I kept my house. I kept my car and car loan. She got 50% of my 401k and 10% of the equity in the house. In one year, she spent it all. She didn't realize that 401k is pre-tax dollars. So when she spent that money, the IOS took out 10% tax, but she owed more than that. And she owed money to the state income tax as well. Then she had to move in with her folks. She's still there 18 months later, and they have to deal with her pill-popping ways. Do I care? Sorry. Zero care is given. I thought other women were demanding for their expectations towards their husbands. Turns out my bar was just so low. I always considered myself the cool wife. I would never make my husband do anything. He could follow his dreams, hang out with friends. I never expected much. Just that he loved me and was there for me. Other wives complained about the basic gifts they got for their birthdays. While I was already happy if my husband remembered mine, I thought those wives were high maintenance. I thought those things didn't matter. He told me he loved me every day, helped me through school. I did stuff around the house, helped me out with my horses. He made sweet love to me, held me as I slept. I thought I had it all. The point is that he never cared about me. He only loved himself. 
He never did anything extra for me. I was just something he managed. I was cast in a role. The reason this marriage worked for so long is because I had so much to give. Once, I had nothing more. When my best became his baseline, I got replaced. I have a date this week, and it hit me just how low my bar is. My date was texting me about what I would like to drink and eat when we watched our movie, asking me about my favorite wine, etc. My initial thought was, wow, how sweet he is doing so much for me. Then it hit me. No, it is basic human decency. My bar was so low. Do I get wowed by a decent host? It just showed how little I expected and how low I valued myself. I just gave and gave, and felt uncomfortable with getting, like I wasn't worthy. He made every little thing he did for me feel big. All the awesome things I did felt small. Not enough. Never again will I put myself so low on the priority list. No longer will I be pushed aside. The next man who will have the pleasure of being my partner will still get a loving, giving partner who will let him be free. But I will come with a set of demands now. Another post-mortem of my marriage that I believed to be so perfect, and now the blinders are off. It's hard to believe that if he hadn't cheated and messed up, I would have believed that dream until the day I died blissfully unaware and happy with my awesome husband. Yep, I'm out of the matrix, all right. The best things I did after my separation. Two weeks after my wife told me she didn't love me anymore and wanted to see other people, she had already started to see someone, I decided to go to a divorce meetup group in Midtown Manhattan. As I walked in, I quickly realized that I was one of the youngest people there, I was 35 at the time, as most people were in their late 40s to early 60s. This was the best thing I ever did. Why was it such a great thing? Well, person after person started telling me their story, they'd give me a play-by-play -play about how bad their partner was and how they'd put up with their nonsense for years. I heard the word, narcissist, more times than I can remember. Some people had been divorced for 10 plus years, and they would rattle off their entire divorce story and how they'd been wronged and cheated on, IIT was like everything happened just days before. There was so much sadness. But more than anything, there was so much bitterness. Many of the people there had been going to this meetup group every week for well over a year, and some people had been going for a couple of years. I imagine they repeat their stories every week. I left that meetup more depressed than when I arrived. The people there had just zapped all my energy. It wasn't because they were upset, it was because they were clinging to all that pain and bitterness. The entire experience felt like I had looked into a crystal ball to see what my life would look like if I held on to all this negative energy. More than anything, this event helped me realize that clinging to how I was wronged was nothing more than a self-inflicted trauma. And yes, I still struggled for months with the divorce, and I still do sometimes, but I always look back to that meetup and remember that I don't want to be some dude in a crappy bar a few blocks from Times Square lamenting about his ex-wife who'd left him 10 years ago.